Um, welcome everyone. It's really nice to see you here. Um, the first half of the session will be, I'm going to talk a bit about my father who fought in Mesopotamia and sh in the First World War. He um, was wounded at Kut al Amara on the 11th of January 1917. Um, and I've done a lot of research about that campaign that not very many people know about. Interestingly, Polly talked about her father being sent to India and all the British um, troops who embarked in, who fought in Iraq in the First World War actually embarked from India, from Dulali, which is um, a place near Bombay. That's where they were stationed. Um, so we're, to get on, because time flashes past, um, we're going to start the reading, the, the session with a reading of Futility by Wilfred Owen, because it was on this very day, the 6th of November 1914, that British troops went into Iraq. Um, uh, they, they landed at Fao, um, near the Shat al Arab River, and shortly afterwards there was a battle to protect the oil pipeline. I will talk about this a bit in my presentation. Um, the Battle of Basra. Um, and so in memory of that, uh, being exactly a hundred years ago today, we'd like to read this poem by Wilfred Ayer. And Adnan Asai, who is from Iraq and is a poet who's written a lot about war, because he fought for eight years in the Iran-Iraq war um, and was also in a military prison for two years and had to flee out of Iraq in order to have his poetry published. So you'll hear some of his own poems a bit later in the session. Um, so Adnan is going to read in honour of Wilfred Owen um, and in honour of all soldiers who die and are wounded in war um, in Arabic. And we're going to do the same in English. So, Futility by Wilfred Owen. Move him into the sun. Gently its touch awoke him once, at home, whispering of fields unsown. Always at work him, even in France, until the snow, this snow. If anything might rise him now, rouse him now, a kind of sun will. Think how it wakes the seeds, woke once the clays of a cold star. Our limbs, so dear achieved, our sides full nerved, still warm, too hard to stir, was it to this the clay can draw? Oh, what made fatuous sunbeams toil to break earth's cross at all? نقله إلى حيث أشعة الشمس لمستها أيقظته مرة بلطف في البيت همس لحقول غير مبدورة. كانت دائما تقضى حتى وهو في فرنسا إلى أن جاء هذا الصباح والفلج إن كان أي شيء يمكن أن يقضى الآن. الشمس قديمة لطيفة سوف تعرف فكر كيف توقظه الحبوب فكر كيف توقظ الحبوب استيقظ مرة واحدة قين النجمة الباردة أهي الأطراف هكذا يا عزيزي الناجز أهما الجانبان الممتلئان بشجاعتي لا يزالان دافعين ومن الصعب أن يتحرك هل هذا كان الطين يزداد طولا يا ماذا فعل شعاع الشمس الأبلغ في خرق يوم الأرض إلى الأرض so, um, I, as I said, oh, that one will have to be um, My father fought in Mesopotamia. He was actually from a coal mining family in, in Wales, South Wales. Um, uh, he met my mother many years later, and I was born actually in the middle of the Second World War. Because people have said to me, gosh, you must be quite old if your father fought in the First World War and was killed. He wasn't killed, luckily. Um, and I say, well, I am quite old, but not that, not that old, luckily. Um, so, um, as well as looking at um, what happened and why this campaign started, um, I'd like to just talk a little bit about the personal search for your um, 
own relatives, and, uh, which I think lots of people have been engaged in this year as it's the centenary of the First World War, but also a lot has been spoken about the Second World War. Um, so where does the story start? For me, it started by finding in a flooded basement. I rescued an old case that I'd been carrying around from house to house with me for years. And I finally had to look in its contents properly to check if there'd been flood damage. And my sister and I found this old photo album of photographs that my father had taken in Iraq in 1916 when he was fighting in Iraq. Um, so this sort of started this great journey for both of us to find um, the father that we'd never known. Um, just out of interest, I don't know how many people have done personal research into their families. Are there people here who have? Um, if you want to know how to get started, local history societies, books and special interest magazines. I spent about two years at the National Archives. I almost slept under the desks at one stage. The internet's fantastic because it's so quick and immediate, but you can't always get everything that you need from the internet. Um, media, news reports and documentaries, because my search for my father in the First World War soon expanded out into a, uh, a review of what was happening in Iraq at the moment, uh, the seeds of which had been sown in the First World War. Um, and of course, the Imperial War, War Museum, the British Museum, Museum, the South Wales Gorgeous Museum, because my father was in the South Wales Gorgeous. This is a picture of my father. Um, I was very surprised because I always imagined him to be quite a big, burly, heroic sort of man. And I found in his war record that he was five foot eight tall and he weighed eight and a half stone. And um, at other talks I've given on this, people said, on the whole, especially if you came from a working class family, the young men tended to be much slighter than we expect them to be now. My son's now both nearly six foot, big bird of people, but here is my father, who's still here, even though he's four um, um, This was an intelligence summary, it was one of the war diaries I had uh, transcribed actually three years of war diaries. And I sort of made little ten line poems out of them um, in rhyming couplets, and I'm just keep them on the time. Um, and then I took them out of that and I made them into little prose poems. And I'll just read you what this says because all the names on this particular page my father had photographed. So I could see um, uh, Adjutant Bickford Smith. Lieutenant Griffiths, Lieutenant Usher, Second Lieutenants Herbert, Hind, and Barker, who were all wounded on this day. I could act, I actually had photographs of them, they were all smoking pipes, standing in front of the tent, with a camel in the background, and smiling very broadly. Um, and also Second Lieutenant Baines, who was killed. So it, it became very much a personal story. As I went on with my research, suddenly the people in my father's album, who were his friends, friend, one by one they were being killed or wounded. Um, something I found very upsetting was that only officers were named in the war diaries. So you have that list I just read to you. And then um, killed Lieutenant Danes and 18 men, or other ranks, OR, they were usually called. Um, and then the wounded uh, officers, and 72 other ranks, 72 men whose names weren't even recorded, you know. Uh, I thought that was incredibly disrespectful and upsetting. And that the little um, bit on, at the bottom said, return to camp to find it 18 inches under water. A night of great discomfort is spent, an issue of two ounces of rum per man, helped to lift their spirits. <laughs> I thought that was just an amazing place. And of course, Mesopotamia, as you know, is around between two rivers, um, uh, the Euphrates and the Tigris. Um, the war in the, the 1914-18 war was fought on both those rivers, along both those rivers. 
I just put this back in because I this was just attached in, in the war diary file. And this was an example of planning the battle the next day. Someone sitting on a crate or whatever, and just with crayons, drawing a little hand drawn map to, to show what how they were going to um, deal with the enemy the next uh, the next day. Um, and just very quickly. Uh, to, to sort of put you in the picture about the campaign. So I don't know how many of you know very much about this Mesopotamia. I, didn't, I knew nothing until I started my research. The Anglo-Persian Oil Company was set up in 1909 after oil fields had been discovered in Mesopotamia. Two years later, Winston Churchill bought a controlling state by company for 2.2 million. On the 6th of November, the British offensive began. Um, which I will explain. And it's interesting that D force, uh, of the forces that fought in Mesopotamia, 75% were Indian. Um, the Indian government was completely against any sort of engagement in Iran, but they were forced, because they were part of the British Empire, to send soldiers who hadn't been trained to fight this sort of fighting, you know, much more of the northwest frontier, that sort of guerrilla warfare. I'm not used to this sort of warfare at all. Um, and then they were completely vilified at the end of the, of the war by the British uh, military and government, who said that the failure of the campaign had been largely down to the failure of the Indian troops who hadn't had the backbone that they should have done, which was completely and utterly wrong. Um, so by, they landed on the 6th of November, and by the 22nd, they had secured the oil pipeline. They could have actually withdrawn, but no, what happened? The war office sent, um, sent a note to say they had to now go on and take Baghdad. There was no reason to take Baghdad. They didn't need to take Baghdad. That's what they did. <coughs> and the um, campaign that followed was utterly um, disastrous. It was underfunded. There were no no supplies, men weren't properly trained. They, nobody had bothered to find out that in southern Iraq, in the spring, March and April, the land floods completely. So at some stages they were men, mules, um, carrying guns, whatever, their cannon, waist deep in water. Um, and the camps that they made constantly flooded so that they were lying in water at night when they were meant to sleep. By the way, sorry, I meant to say, oh, sorry. I just wanted to say that this was a bat's my father's shadow. So that's the closest <laughs> I'll ever get to my father. And that's the, the South Wales Borders Camp. And this is a bridge of boats they made to cross the flooded land. That's the only way we could get across. Um, this is the picture on my book, Taking Mesopotamia, a book of poetry. Um, and it's just bathing in the river. And I think it says a great deal because there's a tremendous air of defeat and futility about the men. And probably the temperatures were either freezing or sort of 125 Fahrenheit in the shade. Um, and that I, the, the naked man just says to me that under uniforms, you know, everyone was the same, and everyone was suffering in the same way on both sides. Um, these are just some pictures I put in because my father took them. Um, this was a hospital boat on the Tigris. Again, very few of the wounded ever managed to get home, but um, there was no morphine, there was no, there were no proper supplies, there was no way of getting, no transport to get the wounded off the battlefield. So they had to be sort of dragged along on uh, makeshift sort of cars. Um, I thought a lot about the animals in war and how terrible it was for them. I'd actually written, written a poem about them in the book. And this is Basra in 1960, an Indian Sikh with his family. Um, and just very quickly, because this was where my father came into this scenario, um, 
the first um, attempt to take Baghdad ended in failure, and so the, I don't know if there's a little thing which I can point. And so General Townsend, who was commanding that campaign, had to bring his troops back here to Kut. Um, and then they were, the, the Turkish army um, sort of followed them back down, led by a German officer whose name I now can't remember, I'm sorry. Um, and they were besieged at Kut for um, 147 days, I think it was. And um, they were told that on no account must they surrender. Lord Kitchener said, I sincerely hope it is realized by you and all general officers under your command that it would be a disgrace to our country to surrender. Our prestige in the East would be gravely prejudiced. And this was because it came very soon after Gallipoli, which of course was a great victory for the Turks. And the British offered the Turks two million pounds in gold in order to sort of settle amicably you know, and say that it was a draw. But the Turks refused, um, wanting a complete victory. So, um, and that again, this is something I found very upsetting. I'll just, this was General Townsend. When I first heard about him, I rather liked him, because I heard that he went into battle with a banjo and a Jack Russell dog called the Spot. And I thought he must be <laughs> quite a nice sort of chap, but I think actually. He was a completely hopeless soldier, and he was probably, the, I don't know, the first, second son yet sent into soldiering, but he was utterly useless and um, led his men into it, to disaster. But um, he, that was his house in Kut, which is still there, and it's now known as the English house by people, by Iraqis. Um, and there he was when they eventually did surrender. Um, he was taken off with all the officers um, by the Turks, and they went to Baghdad where they were billeted in very nice um, houses and enjoyed lots of very nice parties and that sort of thing. Uh, but the ordinary ranks, as uh, said in the uh, research I was done, the nightmare began. They, they were forced on a 1,200 mile march across the Syrian desert. A lot of them had no boots or hats or very little clothing by that time. Um, and most of them died on that march. Uh, of the 2,592 British troops captured at, captured at Kut, only 837 survived. Um, the Indian troops fared slightly better because many of them were Muslim, and so the Turks sort of um, treated them slightly differently. A new offensive under General Maud was la launched on the 13th of December 1916, and this is what my father was involved in. And they advanced up both sides of the Tigris, and they did take Cook then, and they advanced on Baghdad, which they occupied on the 11th of March 1917. Um, and I just put a couple of, the someone at a talk I gave came and said her father-in-law, T Brigadier T. E. Osmond, um, had been at the siege of Kut, and he was the he was the medical officer, and he told lovely anecdotes like only he and the padre were allowed to keep a gun, um, and they used to go up onto the battlements or the equivalent of battlements and shoot starlings as the these murmurations of starlings, because uh, everyone was so starling it was completely starling, and. Uh, she had actually written a, a really lovely poem about that. And it's such a vivid image, you know, this besieged city with starlings by me. Um, and this was another person who came to a talk I gave at the National Archives. And this was his grandfather, who was in the South Wales Borders. So this, for me, has been a huge journey of expansion and meeting others. Um, and this is the British Soldier Cemetery of Cook in 2012, but from that, from that war. Um, and in 1919, Lord Graham Falladin, when his memories and reflections were published, he said, the best thing would be if we could say we had taken and gained nothing. Taking Mesopotamia means spending millions on irrigation and development. 
no immediate or early return, keeping up a large army in an unfamiliar country with a perpetual menace on our flank from Kurdistan. Um, so, 90 years after the start of the war to end all wars, the Second Battle of Fallujah. Um, and now, US and UK favours in Iraq, plus Al Maliki's repression of Sunnis, seeding ter current terrorism, which now, as we know, threatens, threatens us all. Uh, and how much I've got four minutes to read to four films, so I should go either go to Great Gallup or. While I'm looking for my book, actually, Jude Adman, would you like to read and then I'll read after you? Yes. I should have introduced Jude Khan Montague and Adman. Jude um, is a, a journalist, a musical teacher, and has written a wonderful book called For the Messengers about the responsibility and the um, trauma of having to be the filter through which news uh, from, you know, news of war and horror comes to the rest of us. Yes, and it's dedicated to the messengers who are the journalists who are out there bringing stories home, but not the kind of um, broadcast journalists that we see here, but um, this is from the, the Reuters International News Agency, and most of the news gatherers, they're just people who happen to live in the communities that they're documenting stories from. For me, they're the messengers here. It's all right, I don't think. Is, is, it, is it the shot? on the swaying branch, a nightingale is busy singing tunefully. A shot. A corpse. The branch is still. Trembles for a moment, then stops. In the forest, all the nightingales have been silenced. The shot by Adma. How silent. And we're now going to read Passage to Exile, which is a longer poem by Adma. And we're going to read again all together. I'll just turn this off العبور إلى المنفى أنين القطار يثير شجن الأنفاق حادرا على سكة الذكريات الطويلة وأنا مسمر للنافذة بنصف قلب تارك النصف الآخر يلعب البوكر مع فتاة حسيرة الفخذين تسألني بألم وذهول لماذا أصابعي متهرئة كخشب التوابيت المستهلكة وعجولة كأنها تخشى أن لا تمسك شيئا فأحدثها عن الوطن واللافتات والاستعمار وأمجاد الأمة والمضاجعة الأولى في المراحيض فتميل بشعره المثيف على دموعي ولا تفهم The wailing of the train echoes the murk of tunnels roaring along the rails of sour memories. Half my heart's nailed to the window, while the other half plays poker with the girl whose skirt exposes her thighs. Painfully <clears throat> and in astonishment, she asks why my fingers are falling apart like the wood of broken coffins. Quickly, as if afraid of not being able to hold on to them, I tell her stories about my homeland, the fluttering banners, the colonization, the glory of the nation, the sex in public bathrooms. With her wet hair, she leans over my tearful face and claims she doesn't understand. And 
وطني حزين أكثر مما يجب وأغنياتي جامحة وشرسة وخجولة سأتمدد على أول رصيف أراه في أوروبا رافعا ساقية إلى المرة لأريهم فلقات المدارس والمعتقلات التي أوصلتني إلى هنا ميموا إن الفار كورنا موتزارت سكاتس هز نوتس أو بسنو كفر باليز I tell her my homeland is sad beyond reason, that my songs are violent, obdurate and shy. I tell her I'll lie down on the first sidewalk I find in Europe and hold my feet up so people can see the traces of school bastinados and the ones from jails, the injured souls that drove me here. Lisa ma ahmilu fi jubi jawazu safar, wa inna ma tariqu qahar. حيث خمسون عاما ونحن نشتر العلف والخطابات وسجائر اللف حيث نقف أمام المشانق نتطلع إلى جثتنا الملولحة ونصفق للحكام خوفا على ملفات أهلنا المحفوظة في أقبية الأمن. I carry no passport in my pocket, just a history of oppression. For 50 years we've been subsisting on a brutish diet of pre-packaged speeches and hand-rolled cigarettes. As we stand before the gallows, watching our own corpses swing. We applaud the rulers too fervently, fearful for our families, whose files fill basements of secret service buildings. حيث الوطن يبدأ من خطاب الرئيس وينتهي بخطاب الرئيس مرورا بشوارع الرئيس واغاني الرئيس ومتاحف الرئيس ومكارم الرئيس واجار الرئيس ومعامل الرئيس وصحف الرئيس واسطبيل الرئيس وغيوم الرئيس ومعسكرات الرئيس وتماثيل الرئيس وافران الرئيس وانواط الرئيس ومحظيات الرئيس ومدارس الرئيس ومزارع الرئيس وطقس الرئيس وتوجيهات الرئيس. Homeland begins each president's speech. And homeland ends each president's speech. And in between, there are the president's streets, the president's songs, the president's museums, the president's gifts, the president's trees, the president's factories, the president's newspapers, the president's stables, the president's clouds, the president's boot camps, the president's statues, the president's bakeries, the president's medals, the president's mistresses, the president's schools, the president's farms, the president's water, the president's orders. ستحدق طويلا في عيني المبتلتين بالمطر والبصاق وتسألني من أي بلاد أنا. She will stare for a long time at my rain and spit washed eyes and ask, What country are you from? Thank you so much. I'm going to read a few poems from the book for the messengers, and Adnan has kindly translated them into Arabic. Yes. Uh, so I'm going to read them in English. Oh, Jude, go on. I know, I know, I do it. Iraq, sifting. In Salia, a woman goes back into the rubble to collect her paraffin heater. It's needed even more without walls. غربنا في الصالحية امرأة تعود إلى الأنقاض لتجمع الزيت للموقد إنها الحاجة إليه أكثر لأنها بدون جدران. Iraq funeral. The child puffed and he blew the condolences tent himself. And 25 others, all the way into the next world. Ma'atam, nafaqa al-tiflu wa ataha khaymat al-azai bi-nafsihi wa khamsatan wa ashirina akhirin ala tuli al-tariq ila al-alam al-akhar. Iraq, Sada City Truth. Who will guarantee tomorrow in our dusty alleyways? 
Ceasefire moments only borrow from the violence and the graves. لحظات وقف إطلاق النار تقترض فقط من العنف والمقابر. Iraq, five years on. After they were blown to bits, I couldn't bury the boys near enough, so I placed three stones outside my house. They'd taken on a little business venture, buying and selling birds. On their first trip to the pet market, a woman strapped with explosives went as well. The eldest made it home, told us what had happened. He died later in the hospital. I kiss the stones, feed their pigeons. Children cannot enjoy their lives. Nothing in this country now brings any good. العراق بعد خمس سنوات بعد أن سقطوا صرعة لم يمكنني دفن الأولاد في مكان قريب كفاية لذا وضعت ثلاثة أحجار خارج بيتي إنهم قد اتخذوا مشاريع صغيرة شراء وبيع طيور في رحلتي من الأولى إلى سوق الحيوانات الأليفة ذهبت امرأة بحزام ناس كذلك الولد الأكبر تمكن من عودة إلى المنزل روى لنا ما حدث ومات لاحقا في المستشفى أنا قبلت الأحجار أطعمت حماماتهم الأطفال لا يمكنهم الاستمتاع بحياتهم لا شيء في هذا البلد الآن يجلب الفرحة photo of my father and this was the one of the first poems I wrote for him father my face is made from yours your jaw your weak right eye my shin bones from your leg shattered in the moonlight as you supervise the digging of the trench at Kut al Amara years on your long dead smile watched us from walls sideboards from our mother's dressing table, casting a shadow round her heart, like your shadow in the album, as you pointed the box brownie towards the bridge of boats at Kerner, the army camp at Kut. Father, those splinters of bone were your salvation, hard shards from which I sprang with shared ancestry looking for you. Um, and the next one is sort of from some of the research I did. And you saw the photo from my father's album of the hospital barge bringing the wounded back from, from the battle zone. Hospital barge on the Tigris. In April, the desert blooms, even in war, flowering earlier than a Welsh spring clustered along the riverbank, rain-scented on a bare, wind-blown canvas, mallow, shepherd's purse, early sown green barley, yellow trefoil and wild mustard, each day budding with promise of more. And on the Tigris, a slow hospital ship carries the wounded, so recently young boys, running home from school down weed-skirted lanes, now tents of white skin hanging slack on frames of bone. Flies buzz in their mouths, the noise drowned by the wheels revolving slap. And I'll just finish with one. Sorry, could add my... Yes. <laughs> so I'll read it first and then I'll go on. Uh, and the, um, the epigraph is from the Epic of Gilgamesh, Tablet 3, and it says, um, As for humans, their days are numbered. Whatever they do is like a puff of wind. 
What wound into the canals was music, snaking into the wounds of war, the desert's music of water, irrigating and cleansing. War's music is a bombardment of timpani and bugle sounds, thin drifts of smoke winding into the sky, above dunes and trenches, above animals and humans, roaring for an end. A few birds, the slap of clothes being washed on stones, the lap of the blooded river in the reeds. But by evening, shepherd's pipes, goat bells and crickets, sounds of life trying to go on as long as water continues to flow. خاتمة شعرية ترجمة رباب غيدا وعدنا صغر كان البشر أيامهم معدودة وكل ما يفعلونه عابر كمريح ملحمة القلقامش اللوح الثالث ما التف داخل الخنادق كان موسيقى تتلوى داخل جراحات الحرب وموسيقى الصحراء هي الماء ريا وتطهيرا موسيقى الحرب إنها قرع دفوف وأصوات نفير سرب من دخان مشعب إلى السماء فوق تلال وحصون فوق البشر والحيوانات فاجين إلى النهاية بعض من الطيور صفع الملابس عند غسلها على حجارة ارتطام نهر الدم في القصي في القصب لكن بحلول المساء مزامير الراعي أجراس الماعز وصار الصيد الليل أصوات حياة تحاول الاستمرار طالما الماء مستمر في جريانه. From um, that's been translated into English by myself and Ruba Abidanda. Uh, so this is a poem I wrote uh, fairly recently, in fact, obviously, um, in response to what was going on in Gaza, and is called "Bread and Circuses, Gaza 2014." Where there were war graves once, the dust of shattered buildings coats the ground and rubble covers wreaths laid days or weeks ago. In that poor earth, whole families lie, or worse, whole families but for one surviving child, whose hospital or makeshift, ref makeshift refuge in a UN, UN school, at any moment could be caught, a fly webbed in the crosshairs of a tank commander's sights. Upon the hills, the audience eats snacks, drinks beer, and cheers each firework flash and bang, applauds each baby torn to bloody shreds, each Roman candle, Catherine wheel. الخبز والسيرك غزة 2014 الشاعر بيتر كينغ مرة حيث كانت هناك قبور الحرب غبار المباني المحطمة يغطي الأرض والأنقاض تغطي أكاليل الزهور الملقاة قبل أسابيع أو أيام مضت في تلك الأرض الفقيرة عائلات بأكملها تقبع أو ما هو أسوأ عوائل بأكملها لكن بقي طفل واحد على قيد الحياة حيث التجئ للمستشفى أو فريقه المؤقت في أحد مدارس الأمم المتحدة في أي لحظة من الممكن أن يقبض عليها حشرة طائرة نسجت شبكة من على مرمى من أنظار قائد الدبابة على التلال الجمهور يأكل وجبات خفيفة يشرب البيرة يبتهج بكل وميض وفرقعة لعبة نارية يهتف لكل طفل مسرد لأشلاء دموية لكل سعادات رومان كاندل وكاثين ويل not a war poem, but it's about death of a different kind. Um, the title and the images in the first stanza are mainly taken from a contemporary account of the symptoms of the Black Death by, and I'm going to have to take a run-up at this, by the Welsh bard 
Ewan gets in that Ewan that place on the bad land. Um, <laughs> Um, <laughs> so, uh, it's a black smoke. Pale skin is ornamented by black pearls, black coral, shattered fragments of the marble of the Earl of Deuce's tomb, erupting from the fragile flesh like sooty halfpence, cinders from a cool, untended hearth. A scant year later, nothing human moves. No smoke from hearths, no rise and fall of scythe or spade or hoe. The rigid roster of the seasons rolls out births and growth and deaths, but once familiar smells and sounds of human lives are gone. Roofs and chimney stacks collapse into the damp, cramped rooms beneath. Lush gardens lose their ordered lines, then rapidly succumb to grazing deer and sheep. And sooner than one might have thought, the village disappears, marked only by a scattering of grassy mounds, a cleansing green death following the black. We're going to bring the session to a close with um, an extract from a, uh, a very long 550 page poem by. Adnan that he wrote during the Iran-Iraq war and partly while he was in a military prison. And Peter and he are going to... Yes. yes just so I got confused. We um, didn't have much time to talk about this. Um, Peter and he are just going to read one very short extract and then there might be ten minutes for question and answer. مقطع من الشيدة وضوك. وكنا سنبقى نعمر هذه البلاد كما شاء الرب في حلمه البابلي جنانا معلقة يترقرق فوق مدارجها الماء والصلوات ولكنهم هدمونا أشادوا على دمنا المتيبس زنزانة وادعوا أنها وطن ثم قالوا هنيئا بما يخصب البلد لا بحر نسلمه بالمراكب يا أيها النائمون على حجر الثورة المستحيلة لا رمل أو زبد رأيت دمي في الطوابع رأيت دمي في الطوابع يلصقها المبعدون إلى أين تسعى بنفسك إن الحياة البلاد التي تبتغي We would have gone on building these lands as God wanted in his Babylonian dream. Water and prayers rippling over the steps of its hanging gardens. But they destroyed us, built a prison from our dried blood and called it a homeland, and then said, be grateful for your country. No sea for us to cover in boats, O oh, you that sleep on the stones of the impossible revolution, no sand or saliva. I saw my blood in the stamps stuck on by deportees. Why are you wandering by yourself? Life is the land that you seek. Thank you so much. Do you want to come up, everyone, to sit in case people want to ask you questions? <laughs> <laughs> does, does anyone have any questions? Um, could, I, could I ask about the, uh, the, um, the, sort of the mode of delivery, the, the, the way that you read? It seems, yeah. it seems to be a very, there seems to be um, the pitch, uh, you know, how high or high, how low the, 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 the voice is, seems to be very important in the way that you, you deliver. Is that, is that, is that right? Yeah, you are right, because I think the poem is not like article or novel or something. It's skin from soul to, to people, and also the, the music, rhythm and rhyme, mm -hmm. some uh, poem for that. The rhythm uh, takes you to uh, moving, like sea, like moving in the sea, mm -hmm. like that. But uh, isn't it true also that the, in, Iraqi, in Arabic poetry, quite often vowels are left at the end of the line, so you can sort of sound, you can stretch the vowels out. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, stretch so, because this is very old. The poem, is, you know, is very old. Mm -hmm. Start for two thousand years ago or, or more, uh, three years, uh, three three thousand years ago until now. 
let's start with the with the poem with the rhythm why uh, they uh, take the uh, camel uh, singing to the camel to and the singing, desert, walking to, to, behind yeah, the camels to, like to, <laughs> to make them uh, and say habab 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 and mutafa'al and fa'al and mutafa'al like that and they keep to uh, camel and to without uh, food without sometimes mm. without water right. yeah, mm. that is and until and after that is Mara'al uh, Qais start with the uh, with this poem and hang for the and mm -hmm. Makkah the by the God. Poems, yes. yes, that is, we keep people uh, happy with the rhythm until uh, came uh, Badr Shak Siyab, uh, she spoke Same. about last time. She yeah. broke like Eliot, like some. Yes, T.S. Eliot. Yeah, mm -hmm. broke the rhythm and broke the. Uh, T.S. Eliot and Gertrude Stein, another modern modernist, mm -hmm. had a, a great influence on Arabic poetry. And there's a, a poet called Al Sayab who was writing in the 20s and 30s. Yeah who sort of broke out of all the old structures which were very traditional, this sort of rhythm, strong rhythm, camel walk, yeah. and um, the idea of singing the vowels, which is so beautiful. Mm. And, but as you can hear from how Adnan reads, they, they ha he does retain, mm. although it's free verse, if you see it on the page, it's sort of free verse, he actually retains some of the rhythms. Some internal rhythm. Yeah. It's very last it's very old, like, sorry, I don't know. ولما قضينا من منى كل حاجة وما سحب الأركان من هو ماسح that is three thousand years the how mm. is this yeah, this is no this is for أمر uh, القي أمر القيس أمر القيس sorry my language is not very well it would be really lovely to have an evening do it with mm. Lucy with music and you mm. 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 where Adnan could <laughs> sing Absolutely. with your yeah. musical yeah. instruments. Yeah. Mm. Yes. That would be lovely. Can I ask, um, yes. was there any um, process, I'm sorry I had to come in mm. um, from the second half, but um, mm. was there any process of um, either Peter or Jenny um, looking at Adnan's translations and having some input into it, or was it a straightforward acceptance that whatever Adnan chose to do with your text was up to him, or did you feel that there was something you could contribute to, I, even though it's not mm. the language that you Well, I, d I edit. Um, <clears throat> Adnan has lots of friends who translate, and actually for this... <coughs> For this book, Singing for an Hour, uh, it was an Arts Council funded book and a lot of the money we were given was spent on translation. We had a, I had a student um, who's Lebanese, Palestinian Lebanese, and she did a first translation and then we worked very intensively on, you know, metaphor and why use this word and not that word, which was, you know, sometimes sitting up to morning and often being fed wonderful feasts by Adnan's wife, Majida, which made it all worthwhile. <laughs> but, and for Peter and Jude's poem, yes, we did. We d couldn't do it to the extent, obviously, we did this, but we were today, this morning, which is why we were slightly arrived in a bit of a rush and a hu hustle, because we were looking at, uh, especially at your poem, with the, the, blow, the boy blew and blew up, and I said mm. it suggested a suicide bomber. Um, and Adnan was asking about that, and we went through that very carefully. And we also <coughs> went through your poem, Bread and yeah. Surfaces. Um, uh, every line we went through, um, uh, whether it's what, you know, the, ideally you would have gone through it and Jude would have gone through it with Adnan, because you know exactly what your intention is. And that brings up actually, Lucy, a very interesting yeah. point about translation as opposed to versions, which is yeah. the big debate at the moment. Mm, and, uh, my, also my uh, uh, daughter Allo, mm. uh, she has helped me uh, to found the correct uh, mm. meaning and then I can uh, poetic, poetic. Yes, poeticize it. Then your son and his Adnan's sons also speak also fluently. Right. So, um, yeah. But it is a long process. Okay. Well, as I seem to be oh, sharing sorry. it. Sorry, one, oh, one question. The last poem, when did you write that? What, do you, I mean, how long and how did you construct it? I mean, 500 pages is... Yeah, yes. since the start in uh, 19... 
1984. I finished it in uh, 1996, uh, 12 years. I was in the war uh, and uh, put in the so bad place. They put me in. And suddenly uh, I found uh, myself to write this and continue. I don't know. First time I just paper, uh, writing, writing, and keep, 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 until so I saw long and many, uh, many pages and continued it until after, after when I was in Beirut, I left my country in 1993. When I was in Beirut, many people uh, asked me to publish all it and. Uh, in that but song. did you did you yes. have to hide the poem initially? Did you did you write it in, in prison? Did you have to hide it? Yeah, this is all this uh, all this book uh, hide is no no official anything in Iraq until ah. I'm left my country. But some poem I, I wrote and published in Baghdad. This is like uh, this is like this is the first poem uh, uh, Jude read with me. Uh, uh, Shout! Mm. I I put in this book. Uh, 19, uh, 1986, this publisher. This is the third book for me. Uh, I put it in the first pages, this poem. Mm -hmm. And also, this is after after publisher, uh, government forbidding it. Mm -hmm. Yes, just mm -hmm. some people wrote, this is it's very, it's not good. <laughs> and they for forbidding this book. So at uh, one time, Adnan was top of Saddam's uh, death list, actually. Nice. So I um, had to go flee to Amman, then to Beirut, where he got a lot of his poetry published. He's had 11, 12 collections published. And then he went to Sweden, and originally he, they, he and his family were put... Because it's not just the person, the poet, who has to go into exile, it's all their family. You know, he had to get all his family out of Iraq. Um, and they put them up right in the far north of Sweden, and I think that really affected Adnan's eyes. He now has <coughs> rheumatism in his eyes. I, I hope he doesn't. Yeah. I hope you don't mind me telling yeah. everyone. Yeah. So he constantly has to go to hospital to have injections in his eyes. And then they came down to Malmo in the south of Sweden, and then eventually they came in 2004 to London, and that's where they've been living in exile ever since. So it's wonderful that he's with us here keep today. Writing, yeah. <laughs> yeah, keep writing. This is a very important thing for the poem for all. Just keep writing. This the poem feel a poet a poem feel like land, like my land or my, my friends. Yes. Poetry, yes. Make poetry your country, he says in yeah. the poem. Yes. So thank you very much. We probably have to finish. <laughs>